Uh, my topic wasn't that interesting. Uh, it has to do more with seawater. Uh, the topic of my paper was uh, thermal haline circulation and the role, its role in economic security. So it's also called the uh, ocean conveyor belt, uh, which is a circulation pattern all over the world that takes water from the Gulf, uh, through the Gulf Stream, it takes it up to Europe, uh, to the North Atlantic, and then it descends down when it becomes warm. Uh, it, you know, the process takes a lot of... Uh, Sorry, you know, I'm going to... Yeah. You know, trying to help. Sorry, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. The process has uh, uh, two main course uh, causes. Uh, first, it's uh, wind, and the other is uh, density. And what, what I mean by density is the water density. And what affects water density? It, you know, salinity. So when the Gulf Stream takes water from the Gulf all the way to the North Atlantic, and I'll show you in the little video uh, demonstration there, it, uh, some of it evaporates. So a lot of H uh, water molecules are evaporated into the atmosphere, which makes the water really, really salty. Once it reaches north, uh, here we go. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. All right. yeah. Hold on, should I bring this down? Should we do that? Yep. This will make a lot more sense when you see it. So basically, uh, you know, the water pump uh, pattern follows it from the Gulf. This is the Gulf Stream. It takes the water, which is warm, uh, all the way up the North Atlantic. Once it's there, uh, a lot of evaporation takes place, so it becomes really dense because it's highly uh, saline. Once that happens, it dips down and follows these grooves in the North Atlantic. Keep in mind that this water is you know, really dense and really, really cold, so it channels down all the way past this is North America right here. So it comes back all the way down, and it reaches the equator. Once it reaches the equator, it continues going down following this path. And then it goes up uh, in an upwell. Uh, once that happens, it reaches Antarctica. And once it reaches Antarctica, it circles the continent. Part of it goes up north into the Indian Ocean, and it becomes... Uh, warmer, uh, which this process is called overturning. Thanks. Um, so it overturns in the Indian Ocean, comes back down, the whole process starts again within this region, and it comes back into Antarctica, and it continues circling. Once that happens, uh, the same process continues all over again. So these different uh, deep water masses are constantly moving, you know, from the Gulf all the way up to the North Atlantic. Uh, all the way down to uh, to Antarctica and you know on the other side of the world, uh, causing and again what I mentioned is what causes this water to move. Uh, it's basically wind and the differences in salinity in the water. One of the first people that actually measured uh, part of this conveyor belt was Ben Franklin. He uh, was one of the first people, if not the first, that actually measured uh, the Gulf Stream. Uh, measured. How did he do that? He measured the water temperature. So he took different readings on his way to Europe, and you know he noticed that part of the water that was taking him there was warmer than the rest of the water in the North Atlantic. So that was the beginnings uh, of that study, but it, he only did it for the, uh, the Gulf Stream, obviously because it's difficult to take measurements from water that's deep down. Why is this important? Uh, and I, on the paper I named that one scientist uh, who works at the, at the Met office in the UK, uh, he said that if just one part of the THC uh, cycle, if only one part were to be stopped, then the whole of the North Atlantic and Europe would be would dip into a, uh, a uh, let me say, into a cooling, sort of like Little Ice Age. This happened before, uh, about 12,000 years ago. Uh, they had a situation in Europe, and there, there's debate into how it happened. But about 12,000 years ago, uh, they had a rapid cooling. 
so they brought you know it brought down temperatures significantly so they had like a sort of like a mini ice age happened about 12,000 years ago and it lasted for 1300 years and it came on unexpectedly and rapidly and it ended rapidly as well and one of the theories of that was that they had a I don't know if you can still see it, but here in North America, obviously they had a huge ice cap, and they had many, many lakes out of you know frozen glaciers, and they think that a lake, uh, I believe the name is Lake. Uh, one second here. I'll get back to you on the name, but there's a there was a huge lake on top of the Great Lakes in North America. So they think one of the you know, theories is that it was dammed with, within other ice around it. So what happened was the structure of that dam just gave way and you know, tons and tons and tons and millions and tons of water uh, got released into the North Atlantic, which caused this Gulf Stream pattern from the Caribbean into the North Atlantic to pretty much cease or stop that caused temperatures to go down. And uh, one of the points that I make in the paper is that what would happen if this sort of deal were to happen again? Well, for one thing, 25% uh, of uh, the total global marine fish, uh, marine life uh, catches come from only 5% of the world's oceans. And that 5% <coughs> are around these up, up uh, wellings that I told you about that have to do with the conveyor belt. So these are some of the problems uh, you know, that present when you have a situation like that. And based on figures, 3.2 billion euros uh, annually is what Europe uh, uh, makes from fishing and commercial fishing. But it's not just fishing alone, because colder temperatures mean that you have to get heating oil. So. All these different countries would need more heating oil, which would put great stresses on their government and would cause, you know, either massive migrations down south or uh, governments defaulting, you know, uh, governments debating whether or not they should spend more money on government as opposed to other services. How would that affect the United States? Well, it's obvious that the uh, interconnectedness of our economies, uh, you know, it's evident. Uh, as you take examples in the Middle East, if something as tiny as, not tiny, but you know, you have a revolution, uh, oil prices go up. You have a situation like this, uh, if you have, you know, just a tiny, uh, if, if the conveyor belt stops and you have Europe go into an ice age, obviously they're going to need more oil and oil is going to spike up and that's going to affect us mightily. So a slowdown of the THC would be catastrophic. So a lot of research is being done into this subject, and that's why it's so important that our, you know, the ice caps, uh, north and south, don't melt. I mean, uh, it's obviously we don't want to uh, drown, but this is one of the reasons why it's really important, because more fresh water into the sea means that this cycle uh, will stop eventually, or be halted, or, or or uh, uh, decreased, but uh, that's how you know it has to do with uh, with the cycle and how it affects uh, economic security, not just in Europe, uh, but in the U.S. So, you know, just to finish up, uh, a lot of research is being done in this area. Like I told you, there are theories still out there that say that predict uh, that this could happen if we continue with uh, what we're doing to the environment. So. A lot, a lot of research is being done on this uh, this topic. So. Um, this this type of catastrophe, I mean, I've read a little bit about it. Uh, in terms of the research you've done, the likelihood of it, when we talk about certainty with climate change and being probably the, the biggest factor to create this issue here, unlikely to happen. Very unlikely. What's the, do you know the well, there, from what I've read, they're still doing a lot of research about this because it's it's happened before. So, 
you know, something that's happened before, scientists look at it and say, you know, this could obviously happen again. Uh, it happened before, you know, there were natural causes, you know, there wasn't as much CO2 in the air, uh, and it still happened. You know, they, around 13,000 years ago, they were coming off the, uh, an ice age. So you had a lot of, you know, huge lakes on top of glaciers. Obviously, we don't have that now, but we do have uh, ice caps. So they're, you know, they're <coughs> melting and they're slowly adding water into the ocean. I guess it won't be as drastic as what happened 13,000 years ago, but it, it could possibly have an effect uh, on climate, especially in the North Atlantic and uh, Western Europe. Yes? I actually just presented um, this last night. I cool. want to know where you got the graph. Oh, this? Yeah. It's uh, off of YouTube. Is it? Yeah. NASA. There you go. I can send you the link if you want. It's cool. pretty cool. I actually did the, the opposite of the argument about the addition of CO2 in the atmosphere and how the water was changed. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Why? Because it's made up of uh, salt water, and the less water, the, le the more that it evaporates, you know, the more salt is concentrated within that water. So it becomes heavier, and then it sinks, and that's one of the root causes of, you know, the conveyor belt, because it goes down, uh, it goes up north, you know, a lot of water vapor is evaporated because of, you know, obviously the sun, so as it goes up, it becomes saltier. As it becomes saltier, it's more dense. And the denser things in water, they just tend to sink, and then it just flows downward. What was the, the figure you gave for the fishing the amount of fishing stocks that come out of five, you said five percent of the ocean? Yeah, uh, I have 25% of the total global marine fish catches come from five upwellings, okay. which is only 5% of the total ocean area. And the other question I have, is this related at all to like the La Nina, El Nino cycle at all? I don't know. Uh, okay. You know, the, the research that I did didn't mention El Nino or, or uh, La Nina, but I, I think that's a, a warming of the Pacific Ocean, okay. uh, which is sort of similar to the warming that happens here. But this water just flows upward, and you know, it just flows down. That warming in, in the Pacific, I, it's maybe something different. I'm not too familiar with that, but it might be a little different. Because it's one of these things, I mean, when we talk about global warming, so everyone talking about oceans rising, but this doesn't get much discussion. It could right. actually be just, did, did your research reveal at all how devastating this could be compared to rising, just flat out rising ocean levels? I mean, this has been able to affect crops. And, well, it's, um, it's, said, not, it's, not mentioned, it's not mentioned a lot. Uh, and, but when, <laughs> I, you know, when I read about it, I thought it was really interesting because you know, it shows how connected all the oceans are. And I was reading, uh, I forget what piece, but they measured, or they did calculations as to how long this whole process takes. And they said it's about 2,000 years. So when like, water dips down here and goes south, that same water comes back up, you know, in theory, uh, 2,000 years from the moment it did that. So that whole cycle is, takes a while. But it did. The but it's not really mentioned. Yeah, the ocean level, level rise is a threat to coastal region, but as you said, you know, cool. European ice age is going to Right, and they're rising right. because the polar ice caps would melt, which would bring more fresh water into the ocean, which would not be good, which is one of the causes why it happened 13,000 years ago. Catherine might know more, too, if she studied it more recently, but when I worked pretty closely with a bunch of clients, climate scientists, this was extremely hotly debated uh, because it was seen as basically a tipping point event, like a really catastrophic, it may not happen, it would have to be really, really extreme, a climate effect if it does happen, but if it does, it's world changing. Um, so it's kind of seen as one of those major tipping point uh, kinds of things, which is why there's so much research into it and what could cause it and what could affect it, other than it completely stopping, which would be like the main tipping point. Could it slow down? Could it alter its patterns in ways that could have lesser effects, um, but potentially also dramatic effects? But it seems to me that there's a lot of uncertainty. And it, again, which is why there's so much concentration of research for it right now. There may be, yeah, I mean, it's several same. years old, so I don't know if there's been a lot more in the last couple of years to have seen than updates from 
starting to realize how much it's the atmosphere is actually driving the ocean uh, uh, currents. So they're starting to realize, like, okay, even with the additions of, say, if there's a potential global warming, whatever, what have you, um, even with warming, it could potentially uh, stop these currents and there's multiple different factors, but also um, with the, the CO2 amounts, with the albedo, whatever, Westerly winds is actually increasing the currents, so it's actually continuing as long as that the currents continue. Like, uh, sorry, sorry yeah. uh, as long as the currents continue, that I mean, it just depends on how much time we actually have to counteract it. What, what the situation is, but it's still like obviously not a the answer. So, but I don't know if we'd be here. But <laughs> I mean, that's like what's being debated. So, Stuff. <laughs> Any other questions for Julia? No, they're not provoking.